there's a great American right there, Michelle Hall. Yeah. Yeah. You've seen some other great Americans, Tim, Luke, you'll see Matt Seaholm, I remember Mark Block. Yeah. Everybody who supported Americans for Prosperity, the donors, the people who've been with it for a long time. Now really, my first political event was the American for Prosperity's event in the Dells about two years ago. And I was just going there as an observer. And I was so impressed by the grassroots support, by people like you that were there that understood what's at stake that understood that it is America that's at stake. Now, unfortunately, yesterday we, I can't use the word celebrate, we marked the second anniversary of the passage of Obamacare. That's the right reaction. Now, the passage of Obamacare was certainly the catalyst for me deciding to run for office. But the reason I ran was far more personal. And if some of you have heard the story, let me apologize, but I think it's important for me to recount why I took the passage of Obamacare so personal. You know, back in 2009, when they were trying to pass this monstrosity, President Obama made a speech, and this is a, not a totally accurate paraphrase, but this is exactly what he meant. He said, you know those doctors? They'll take out a set of tonsils for a few extra bucks. He was trying to demonize medical professionals, professionals to pass Obamacare. The reason I took that so personally is our first child, our daughter Carrie, was born with a very serious congenital heart defect. So the first day of life, she was rushed down to Milwaukee Children's Hospital where one of those money-grubbing doctors came in at 1.30 in the morning and saved her life. Eight months later, when her heart was the size of a plum, another group of money-grubbing, wonderful, dedicated, incredibly skilled set of medical professionals performed open-heart surgery for seven hours. They totally reconstructed the upper chamber of her heart. Her heart operates backwards now. But she's 28 years old, and she's a nurse herself in a neonatal intensive care unit. Now she's saving those little babies' lives. <laughs> Our story had a happy ending because Jane and I had the freedom to call up Boston Children's, to call up Chicago Children's, speak to the best heart surgeons in the world find out what was the most advanced treatment. That's what's at stake. Are we going to have that type of freedom under Obamacare? My current mission in life is to paint a picture for the American people of what our health care system, what our freedoms, what our federal budget is going to look like if we actually implement this monstrosity. It won't be a pretty picture. Now, Jane and I had that freedom because our founders had a vision. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Think of how elegant, how extraordinary, how powerful those words are. 235 years ago, those, those, those were revolutionary words, yet our founders had it right. They are self-evident. I spent the last year pretty frustrated. I'm working in Senator Harry Reid's do nothing Senate. It hasn't been fun. What I've tried to do is what we need to do. We need to inform, we need to educate, we need to persuade, 
We need to win the argument. That's what we have to do. So what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to simplify, first of all, the financial situation, and, and really, describing what the problem in America today is actually pretty simple to do. The solution is not going to be easy, but describing the problem is simple. Far too many Americans have forgotten the basic foundational premise of this nation. What our founders knew, because our founders came from dictatorial monarchies and aristocracy, our founders knew the government was something to fear, not something to solve our problems. They understood that as government grew, our freedoms receded. Our problem today is that far too many Americans are addicted to government. The left has been relentless in their quest to addict Americans to government. Hmm. They have been e depressingly effective at it. So now, today, Americans look to government to solve our problems. And far too many Americans are trading their freedom for a false sense of economic security. Anybody feeling particularly secure? No. no. You know, there are some pretty depressing polls out there that say that more than 70% of Americans believe that we will pass in America onto our children not as prosperous as the one we grew up in. Why didn't they think that? That's true. Because 100 years ago, our federal government was 2% of our, of our size of our economy, 2%. State and local governments were 5%, so total government was 7%. Only 100 years ago, what's happened? Income tax. We made it easier for government to grow, and guess what? Government grew. So now, today, when you add federal government with state and local government, we're 40%. 40 cents of every dollar flows through some form of government. Now, I don't know about you, I do not find government particularly effective or efficient. <laughs> And you know, in the end, we talk about capitalism, socialism, communism. It's a number. It's that number. Norway, a European-style socialist nation, is also at 40%. Greece, anybody here in Greece recently? <laughs> They're at 47%. Italy's 49%, France is 53%. I don't know why anybody would want to move us in that direction. What happened to the Soviet Union? Venezuela is a basket case, and anybody vacationing in the island paradise of Cuba recently? The answer is no. Now, I didn't really come here to depress you. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I've, I've got a unique capability of taking a group of smiling faces and turning those smiles to frowns. <laughs> My purpose here is really to inspire you to thank you for being involved and inspire you to get further involved, to get others involved. As, you, as a United States Senator, as your United States Senator, I am witness to some marvelous and inspiring things. You know, I said that certainly Obamacare, the passage of that, was the catalyst for me to run. My true inspiration for running was back after 9-11, as I watched those brave 18, 19, 20-year-old kids and their kids step up to the plate to defend our freedom. From what, to what I've seen. Two weeks after I was sworn in, I had an opportunity to go to Afghanistan. We went down to the Marine base called Camp Leatherneck in the Helmand Province and spent a real hotbed. There have been a lot of casualties. Commanding General, as he's wrapping up his briefing,
made a comment about the current generation. Let's face it, we, all, we, always, all, we always question the most recent generation. He said, listen, anybody who questions this generation's capability, their commitment, their mettle, you come here to Camp Leatherneck and you meet my fine young Marines. I did. I was inspired. I am in awe of them. I've been to Walter Reed. I've been to Bethesda Naval Hospital. I went to Walter Reed the week before it closed down. I went to the rehabilitation ward. There were 12 of the finest among us. Men and women with horribly broken bodies. Unfortunately, a whole soldier is just missing a foot. By the way, do you know what they call the, the landmines to take off a foot? They call them toe ticklers. That's their bravado. The day I was there, there were probably five or six individuals missing three limbs. And when I say missing three limbs, there's not much left. One of the, those individuals had his beautiful wife and daughter helping him with rehabilitation. By the way, the sacrifice just isn't, it just isn't coming from those that serve, but their families. One of those triple amputees, as I was talking to him, he said, Sir, when I get done with my rehabilitation here, I go up to the floor where the new guys come in, and I boost their morale. There's no way you can leave a situation like that not inspired, not awed. Three weeks ago, I had the honor, I had the privilege of attending a ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery. First Lieutenant David Johnson was laid to rest. I joined his family in honoring him. He gave his life for our freedom on January 25th in Afghanistan. We all need to be inspired. We all need to take up the fight. Because this is a fight for our fundamental freedoms. America is something precious. It deserves to be preserved. It's up to us. It's on our shoulders. The American spirit is alive. Yes. It lives in their hearts and is living in your hearts and minds. So let me conclude with just a simple prayer. God bless your efforts. And may God continue to bless the greatest nation in the history of mankind, America. Thank you all.